morning, everyone. My name is Amin Menena. I'm the coordinator of technical programs and research at Good Roads, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Uh, just quick housekeeping before we start. We encourage you to ask questions when you have them in the QA function. You can access the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. If you hover your mouse at the bottom of the screen or sometimes at the top of your screen, you'll see the Q&A function. Just type your questions whenever it occurs to you and we'll, we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. This webinar has also been uh, recorded and we will have it available on our YouTube channel. And if you missed our previous webinars on uh, 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 on uh, corrugated uh, spiral uh, uh, pipes and culverts, you can find it on, on the YouTube channel as well. Today, our, uh, today's webinar is co-presented by Ray Wilcock, the Executive Director of uh, CSPI, and Phil Carroll, the Senior, senior Regional Engineer at uh, Atlantic Industries. Ray is the executive director of the Corrugated Steel Pipe Institute. He holds a uh, science diploma from Champlain uh, College and a Bachelor of Commerce from Concordia University. On graduation, he started with the Dominion Bridge and uh, a company who built many of the major bridges, uh, bridge crossings across Canada. Over the past three decades, he had held a number of senior executive positions at several corporations in the, in the infrastructure industry. Phil graduated from uh, PCIT with, uh, with a diploma in civil engineering, civil and structural engineering technology. He then graduated uh, from uh, Lakehead University with a bachelor in engineering. Phil worked in a consulting engineer in road design and construction until the 1997 in Toronto and Vancouver and translated uh, transition to uh, application engineering, specializing in buried soil steel structures in the transportation and mining sector in Western Canada. Phil's main professional interest continues to be the design and construction of buried structures and working daily with owners, engineers, and, uh, and installers. With that, I won't take too much of your time. So uh, please go ahead, uh, Ray. Okay, Amin, can you see that? I just wanna make sure before I start. Yeah. Okay, well, welcome everybody. And uh, thank you for joining us today. The outline of what we're going to cover today is I'm just going to spend a minute on the Corrugated Steel Pipe Institute, the CSPI, uh, give you a definition of what a buried bridge is, uh, go through the standards and guidelines that uh, we follow, uh, talk a little bit about fabrication, applications for buried bridges and the durability, and then I'm going to pass it over to Phil, who's going to talk about design overview, the benefits of buried structures, and go through a number of projects uh, right across Canada from Newfoundland to British Columbia. And then I'm gonna end with the environmental carbon footprint and just talk a little bit about that uh, and open it up for questions and so forth. Uh, the Corrugated Steel Pipe Institute is an association where we represent the manufacturers of corrugated steel pipe and structural plate corrugated steel. Uh, Armtech and Atlantic Industries are major players that have plants pretty well right across Canada. Uh, Hubcap and Frontier are regional players. Uh, we also have steel producers in our membership. ArcelorMittal, DeFasco out of Hamilton. ArcelorMittal is the largest steel producer in the entire world with close to 55 to 60 plants worldwide. Uh, Ironside make machines uh, for producing corrugated steel pipe. Uh, Leland Industries is in just outside of Toronto. They make nuts and bolts uh, for structural plate. Uh, Advanced Coil Industries do coatings, uh, AK Steel. Uh, they are a producer of steel for like things like aluminum, aluminized steel. Warner Custom Coatings, they also do coatings for structural plate. Uh, we also have members uh, outside of uh, Canada. Velfilm is out of Brazil. 2BIO is in Paris, France. Uh, Rondell and CMP are in Australia. 
Viacon is in uh, Poland and Bulgaria. Uh, Birkenhoek is in the Netherlands and Marmac is down in uh, South Carolina in the United States. And so we have a number of members international where we're able to share information uh, between uh, the CSPI and them as to what are the best practices that are out there in different countries and so forth. And for them to learn on a lot of the research that we conduct here in Canada on our materials and so forth. So what is a buried bridge that we're talking today? Well, it's a conduit with spans that are greater than three meters in span. So we're talking footing to footing. Uh, they offer resistance from the structure and surrounding soil. So our rule of thumb is anything less than three meters is considered a culvert. Anything greater than three meters is considered a buried bridge. Now, it depends upon the province that you're in. For instance, in uh, Alberta, I believe it's 1500 millimeters. So about one and a half meters. Uh, anything over that they consider a bridge. So, but most, many of the jurisdictions in Canada and the CHBDC, it's three meters in span. And a buried bridge is distinguished from a culvert to describe the importance of these large structures for highway safety. The first structural plate corrugated steel buried bridge was uh, manufactured and installed at the Naval Battery Cape Spear in Newfoundland in 19, uh, that's a picture in 1941, but it was um, installed in 1934. And it was used to house 600 pound shells uh, anti-submarine for the anti-submarine guns where the allied forces would throw the uh, uh, the um, shells into the Atlantic Ocean after the uh, German U-boats. And it still exists today in uh, the uh, Cape Spear in Newfoundland. It's about a 30 minute drive east of St. John's, Newfoundland. The material codes that we, we go through are, um, or, or, you know, follow are CSAG 401, and ASTM, so the American Material uh, and Installation Design Standards. So we follow both of them um, for both, depending upon you know, what we're working on and so forth. Just a little bit about the fabrication of structural plate. Uh, it would come on a series of plates on a flatbed truck to one of the manufacturers. They in turn would corrugate it and uh, punch it, put the holes in it. It would sit on the floor, an order would come in, uh, and then the, some engineer would do a design. They would send it out to the plant. It would be uh, you know, either bumped or run through a machine and it would be curved to a certain radii. And then in turn, it would be shipped over to a coder. It would be either uh, dipped in a, a zinc to produce a galvanized coating, or it would be sent to a polymer coder. Uh, like Warner Custom Coatings that uh, is one of the members of CSPI. The corrugation profiles for structural plate, the, the smallest one is 152 by 51, and the largest is 500 by 237. So these are what we call deep corrugated plates. When I started in the uh, this industry back in the 1980s, all we had was 152 by 51. So when these structures were being installed, they were very floppy and very flexible and you had very large spans and you had to use struts and supports and plumb bobs and to make sure you know, that you were looking at deflections and so forth. However, when deep corrugated came on the scene uh, pretty well in the 90s, uh, it basically uh, took over for some of the larger spans and so forth and they became much more rigid during installation. Uh, here's a picture just to show you of the smaller corrugation, the 152 by 51, and this one here is 400 by 150. So we're talking about 400 crest to crest, 150 uh, crest to valley type of thing, okay? So crest to crest here, 400, and then crest to valley in here is 150. And going through, going into the uh, deep corrugated uh, plates or whatever, it increased stiffness and load resistance. So they pretty well stand up on their own. Uh, rule of thumb that the manufacturers use for 152 by 51, they go up to about eight meters in span. And again, when we're talking span, we're talking footing to footing. Uh, for the uh, medium, the deep core, uh, we go up to 24 meters in span. And then for the largest corrugation, 500 by 237, really over 30 meters in span. And uh, Phil will show you a picture later of what's in the Guinness Book of World Records that is uh, greater than 30 meters in span. So we're getting really, really large 
you know, a third of a football field, uh, which is huge. And you think of throwing a football field, you know, 30, 40 meters, it's quite a ways uh, to go from span to span. Uh, shapes, everybody knows what a round is, but uh, they, you know, they come in arches like you can see in that picture on the top right, or on the bottom, a more boxy, boxy uh, style. And they can be shaped to many, many different shapes to fit obviously uh, you know, the site conditions and what is required. For structural plate applications, uh, watercourse crossings, uh, they can become grade separations, uh, bridge rehabilitation, or culvert rehabilitation, uh, wildlife overpass, like the one out uh, towards Banff and between uh, Calgary and Banff, uh, wildlife underpasses, or sometimes we can even stand these up and create a vertical caisson, maybe a base for a tower, a wind tower, or a, a solar tower, or whatnot. Uh, the different coatings that we have the, for sacrificial, we have uh, galvanized, which is a zinc coating. Uh, it started it basically to be produced in the 1930s. And then we have what is called a polymer barrier coating, a thermopolymer. The first one that uh, was introduced uh, was in 2005. Why uh, polymer came? Polymer was worked on back in the 90s. And the reason why it was, uh, uh, you know, came into to fruition versus the zinc is we have uh, certain water and soil chemistry conditions across the country where we require a much more robust co uh, coating. So it's a barrier coating that's applied to the steel. It eliminates or minimizes contact with the environment, environmental con uh, contaminants. Things like road salts, uh, soft water versus hard water, uh, low resistivity versus high resistivity and so forth. So it broadened the allowable range of environmental parameters, okay? Uh, it is a ethylene acrylic acid and it's about 10 mils thick over the black steel on both sides. Here is a picture of a Warner plant in Guelph. And basically the sheets come in black, they're cleaned and then they're hung up just like you would see probably in an automobile type industry. And then they're run through and the, uh, the coating uh, is basically sprayed on to either side. It goes through a furnace and then it's cooled and so forth and uh, checked to make sure that thicknesses are right and so forth. Uh, we have sites that um, we basically <clears throat> wanted to do test uh, a number of years ago. This is one up in Sudbury, Ontario, uh, where we had polymer connected to galvanized. This was in very soft water conditions and we wanted to determine what the, the impact is because you do these tests in the lab and they will say that they last 75 to 100 years. But at the same time, you have to do the same tests out in real site conditions. So we have site uh, tests in BC and Ontario and Alberta and uh, Newfoundland and so forth. And we started these a number of years ago back in the 90s. Uh, so here's just an idea of some of the coating applications. Sometimes you can do just part polymer and part to galvanize, uh, you know, the uh, plates that are going to more or less be in contact with the water and so forth, if, if required. Uh, this was the first polymer coated structural plate in Canada. It goes underneath the Highway 401 in Kingston at the Charbot exit. Uh, and what the MTO allowed us to do was basically just polymer coat the external sides of those plates. Uh, because of the salt spray trucks that would come down the 401, they wanted to make sure that if the salt was going to be sitting on top of the structure, that, uh, you know, it would be protected uh, down below. So these were just polymer coated at the ends, both ends of the, the highways, and uh, just on the outside. Uh, there's a picture of what it looks like uh, just a couple of years ago. I was there in 20, uh, 2020. I, uh, no, 2021, actually, I was there. So I just took a few pictures of, uh, uh, of what, it, what it looks like from the outside. And there's a picture from the inside. You can see that it's galvanized inside. So the polymer is just on the outside. And here's a map of Canada just to show you uh, the differences in, in the soil and the water chemistries that we have. 
The green is very, very hard water conditions, a lot of limestone, so you have very hard water. Whereas when you get into the red zones and so forth, you're getting into very low pHs and very soft water conditions. So again, uh, depending upon uh, the conditions you have, you might need a different material. Uh, we have a performance guideline for structural plate. It's Tech Bulletin 13. If you're interested in it, just let me know afterwards and I can send you a copy or you can get it on our website. Uh, and it basically uh, tells you what material will fit in what type of environment. For instance, uh, for polymer, if you're looking for a 75 year estimated material service life, we're looking at a pH between four to nine, greater than 750 ohm centimeters. And when it comes to chloride, sulfates or hardness, not applicable leaning, no problem. Polymer will, will last forever, okay? So with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over to Phil Carroll. Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So Ray, can you see my screen? We're good to go? Good to go, Phil. Thanks. Yeah, today I'm going to talk about design resilience and some case histories. Just a, a fairly quick overview, uh, especially on the design end, can it could get quite complicated. Let's see, screen is not advancing. Okay. Okay. What? Oh, here we go. Let's see if I can. So design codes um, that we commonly use uh, for spans less than three meters uh, in Ontario, um, we use the, the uh, Ontario Provincial Standards specifications. Um, and, um, and then we pull from AASHTO as well as ARIMA. And for the most part, those are height of cover tables. They're fairly simple to understand and, um, and uh, get a grip on what you're doing design-wise. If you, the span goes beyond three meters, uh, here in Canada, we use the Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code or CHBDC for short. Um, that's a picture of it just on the right, the front cover. And then the updated, it just came out, it was updated uh, in 2019. Um, it provides a, a much more thorough approach to design based on, on ultimate strength principles. So it's more like a limit states design approach. Um, and it better addresses deep and deep corrugated structures as well as constructability. That little picture in the middle there is, is the CSPI um, guide or the CSPI handbook. Um, it was green, I call it the green handbook, but it's now got a new cover. And in it, it has a step-by-step -step process on how to navigate uh, the CHBDC equations. So structural design. I just wanna talk really briefly about um, small diameter pipes. So commonly there it's, it's a thin walled steel conduit and it's sort of classified as a flexible type structure. So it's allowed to deflect under load. What's really, really important uh, to make the corrugated steel pipe um, function uh, in terms of serviceability is, is, a, is a granular well graded backfill envelope that's, that's well compacted with known, known properties. Now, what that little box actually shows is there's a, there's a picture at the bottom of the screen. I just took a, a blow up of the backfill envelope and that's, so all that area inside that, that um, rectangle at the bottom of the screen um, is, is gotta be well compacted, well graded granular material. So it's gotta be installed at a, at a known stiffness level. Structural design, the first thing to realize or think about is, is live load. Um, most people are pretty familiar with different types of trucks. Um, the, the live load actually dissipates through the, the backfill uh, to the arch crown and it's dependent on the height of cover. Uh, so where that truck is relative to the top of the arch and the live load dissipates uh, with soil depth as you go down as, as like a, a typical foundation load. Um, the live load pressure depends on the vehicle mass as well as the footprint. So the CHBDC has sort of uh, truck um, schematics on, on where the loads are, are uh, transferred to the ground or to the conduit. So if you're dealing with um, structural design less than three meters, this is a, a pretty common little diagram. It shows the, the truck uh, approaching the, 
the, the, uh, the corrugated steel pipe that's buried at depth. Again, the live load is, is transmitted through the soil. So it's like a prismoidic type load distribution onto the crown of the, the, the structure. And the other load that's being um, on, uh, exerted on the structure itself is the, is the dead load. And so that's just the, the soil density, which is just the soil density times the height of the soil. That gives you the, the live load pressure. Um, the minimum cover uh, for these small diameters is, is set to commonly um, H min of, of diameter over six. Um, or 300 millimeters, whichever is greater uh, for less than three meter diameter. It is required, uh, that minimum cover is required to keep the bending moments small enough to be safely neglected so that you can count on 100% ring compression. Yet the other small point there is it, um, uh, it prevents soil wedge upheaval. So as that truck is approaching, it doesn't push a pressure wave and, and cause the soil to come right off and, and become mobile. For the most part, these structural designs for less than three meters are all driven by design tools, which are simple height of cover charts. So you you know you figure out what your live load is, and you look at, at a height of cover chart to figure out what wall thickness that you require. Structural design for greater than three meter spans are a whole different world. Um, the design considers both axial compression and bending moments. So when you see this train driving across um, this, this box culvert, this is just north of Toronto here, um, it, it, you can see that it starts to look like a semi-rigid frame so that there's bending moments just like a, a normal tight frame. So you've got a positive bending moment on the top arc of that, that box culvert and, and negative moments on the, um, in the haunch, the tiny the, um, curb portions near the, 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 uh, the haunch area. So just to explain it a bit further for structural design greater than three meters, um, what you'll what the first design check you'll do is check the minimum design cover. Um, so there's equations for that. Second is to, to look at the total thrust, the live, dead, and seismic loads. So those are all broken out. Um, and then you can calculate the compression stress at ultimate limit state. You calculate the wall strength in compression. And then you check the wall strength during construction. So commonly item five there is the one that I check the most. Um, it just, that can be off in the governing load case just as the, the structure's being backfilled. And then you check the wall strength of the completed structure. So for design, structural design for greater than three meters again, um, you can use a spreadsheet and many consultants, especially in Western Canada that I deal with, uh, they, they actually build their own spreadsheets for 152 by 51 corrugation uh, and, and virtually all shapes. And then for deep corrugated structures for single radius only. So you can build a spreadsheet using the code equations. For structures that are different than that, you have to use rigorous analysis, finite element method or Plaxis or um, other types of uh, design software. And you can use that for all corrugations and shapes. Commonly, these are designed by specialty consultants or manufacturers in a, in a delegated design where the manufacturer is given the, the um, uh, contractual uh, ability to design the structure on their own. So if you're designing for greater than three meters and you're using the finite element output, uh, this is what you'll commonly see. There's just some nice graphics here. Um, it'll actually plot up what the effective stresses are in the soil uh, as the live load goes over it. It'll calculate what the, um, or show the stresses that are actually in the, in the conduit itself. That's what the picture on the, on the upper right there is. That's a bending moment diagram. So I mentioned earlier, yeah, you get a positive moment as you, as you go over the structure and you get negative moments in the upper haunches. So that's, that's what you'd see. Uh, it's a whole different world than, than simply looking up on a height of cover table. So what the output is, is pretty straightforward uh, for a structural design greater than three meters. Uh, you'll end up with a wall thickness to support the load and you'll work out what the thrust is. Uh, you can get the, the moments in the arch itself, um, but that's, that's what you end up at the end of the day. Um, what the thrust is commonly used for is to design your footings. Um, if you're using a spread footing or a pile foundation. So once you've got that structural design done, uh, the next step is to understand the estimated material service life or EMSL for short. And Ray showed you that uh, tech bulletin earlier. 
uh, that details it out. It's a pretty comprehensive bulletin. Uh, what it starts off with is a simple flow chart. And it, to determine EMSL, you, you have to understand what the abrasion level in the creek is. And that's, that's a function of uh, the water speed and, and the amount of uh, uh, material flowing through the creek, normally substrate like rock and gravel. And the other combination is, is also water chemistry. So what, what's the water like in terms of electrochemical properties? Bit of a complicated slide here. Sorry, I had to explain this on one slide. Um, this is a, a what, what I would look for in a 75 year EMSL. The first thing I do is start on the on the left and understand what the creek is doing in terms of abrasion limits. So there's that table in the upper left, there's uh, abrasion levels one through four. Uh, again, it's a combination of what the bed load is. It could go from non-abrasive all the way to severely abrasive where you're looking at sand, gravel, and rock flowing at four and a half meters per second. Um, where you, um, you know, the, you actually commonly look at that in a, in a return period of Q2, and that would set your, your design velocity to figure out your, your, um, your abrasion limits. So once that's done, you move down to that box on the lower uh, left, which is to um, start understanding what um, co uh, coating that would be most appropriate. So polymer coated would go to a, abrasion level three, galvanized to abrasion level two, and then alternate structures or a composite system uh, up to four. And what that means is where you start looking at armor plates or you start looking at um, open bottom structures. And that's, that's what that gray area is on that bottom left. So the next step, once you figure out abrasion is to actually look at the table on the right, which is to figure out the electrochemical of what the water is doing inside the structure. So um, I won't go through all of that, but what you can be assured of is that polymer steel, once you coat it, it, it gets you into um, uh, wider and wider limits for pH as well as resistivity. So um, you'll commonly see uh, water resistivity in, in, in areas where you've got hot soils and, and uh, you, know, you have to start thinking about polymer steel, not for the entire periphery, but certainly in the area of, the, of where it's being dipped inside that water. The other thing to be careful of is um, if you go down to the bottom is, is soil pH. So uh, it's quite common to pre-qualify the backfill that goes around the arch and um, where you have, uh, you know, soil pH is five to 10 and sulfates and chlorides in that, um, in that less than 200 and 100, uh, you can use galvanized steel. If, if you're looking at more hotter soil that's not available, um, you can't get more neutral soil then you can you have to switch to polymer steel. So it's a bit of a playoff on this uh, on this one slide where you have to understand um, you know what you're dealing with velocities, abrasion limits, as well as what's going through the, the, the structure and um, and what you're putting uh, what the water's doing inside the structure. So what I like to commonly you know suggest to designers is it's, it's all fine and great to come up with a wall thickness and a thrust and figure out your footings but you also have to be aware of the coating and that that would that's what makes a complete design when you're looking at you know the material service life so design capabilities uh for these these uh especially deep corrugated structures they can go all the way up to 35 meters in span and with um the, the clearance has to be uh, greater than 20% of the span. So that's the vertical clearance. And you can get estimated service lives greater than 75 years. Here in BC, where I'm from, um, commonly the DOT requires a service life of 100 years. So we just run the equations a little bit further into the future. Now, design versatility of these, of these uh, products, they are available uh, for, for structures with a lot of deep bury. Uh, so you can get, you know, uh, you know, where you have structures that are built basically at the bottom of uh, valleys and you have to fill them up and where dead load really matters a lot. Uh, they are suitable for heavy live loads like haul trucks, track vehicles, uh, railroads. Um, they typically have a reserve for capacity for overload conditions. So what's quite common on mining applications, we'll design a, a structure to say a CAT 797, like a 1.2 million pound truck, and then two weeks later, we have to drive a machine like that, like a 3 million pound shovel across the top and figure out how to make the design work. So it's, it's, there's certain tricks of the trade on how to make those off 
of highway overloads work. Um, but that's a, a picture from New Mexico where we had to do that. You can also accommodate seismic uh, forces as well. So if you live out here in the West, especially in BC and the Vancouver Island area, we, we have to design all structures for, for seismic. Some of the construction benefits, uh, it is economical to ship. So the plates are fully nested. So that picture on the upper right is just how the structures are commonly shipped. So there's not a lot of air, you're shipping quite commonly by weight. Um, and it, for that reason, it, these, these structures are economical to ship to very remote locations, like some of the places in the Arctic. It is, the installation is, is done commonly without large cranes. Um, you know, you can assemble, depending on the span, you can use an, a, even a track excavator to assemble some of the structures. The, there is less design and construction time is required. Uh, sometimes it, we can, we can, if we get a, um, a concept going in, in February or March, we can be building in the, in the summer. So it's very difficult to do that with, with more um, complex rigid frame structures. Commonly, they, they take longer to, to actually get together. And they are durable. Um, the, for bridge decks, what you'll see, especially if, you know, in the old days, you used to use uh, uh, carbon steel, just blade block bar for their bridge decks. And you'd be out there having to jackhammer the bridge decks quite commonly. Uh, that's uh, on the wane, I think, more now, but um, it's it's still an issue. Um, and there, also the expansion joints are sometimes painful to, to fix and to rehabilitate. Uh, with these buried structures, there, there is none of that. It's essentially you're, you're, you know, you're having to go out and grade, you know, uh, maybe shave and pave uh, the, 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 uh, the pavement once in a while. And it's not that um, a, a total shutdown where you're shutting the lanes down. In terms of driver safety, uh, especially in the winter time, uh, it's quite common, um, especially in the, in the Western Canada, we get, we put bridges uh, in some mountain areas and, and we have uh, bridge decks freezing um, prior to the, the approaches freezing. That can cause a bit of concern. And so there's a lot of signs, uh, especially in, in, in BC here of uh, bridge decks icing before the, the actual approaches. So you have to commonly uh, put your brakes on before you hit the bridge. Uh, with a buried structure that you don't have that it, it's the brooch is similar to what there is no bridge deck so it doesn't freeze prematurely. Now there's been some work and research done by the Transportation Research Board. Uh, they meet once a year and there's there's workshops on buried structures and so there's been a lot of uh, research in just different uh, jurisdictions everywhere from New Brunswick MOTI here in BC as well as private uh, Ohio uh, Department of Transportation. Uh, and they've looked at what traditional bridges cost and typical buried bridges. So these would be on either piles or spread footings. And commonly the costs are, are significantly less for a buried structure. So art structures, there is uh, cost benefits to look at um, steel versus precast concrete. Uh, a few years ago, people put together a, uh, a comparison uh, looking at a, a roughly a 15 meter span uh, arch, about 41 meters long, uh, and, and looked at the different parameters which, which are important to owners, which are the structure cost, the, the backfill material, the, the footings, the installation, the freight, and, and the service life. So that's those are the parameters running down the left. Uh, what you'll see with the steel is it's commonly um, less than the, the precast arch on the right. Um, the structure cost is fairly competitive, uh, but the further you get away from the precast uh, plant, um, it, the, the cost of the steel actually uh, makes more sense. There's less freight involved. Uh, the backfill material is the same. Um, commonly, um, deep corrugated structures, the, the steel structures can accommodate more settlement. So oftentimes the footings are, are less cost. The installation is less cost. Um, it, it doesn't require a large crane to install. And like I mentioned before, the, the plate shows up on a fully loaded truck. Commonly, you can ship a whole bridge on one, maybe two trucks instead of dozens. Uh, and the service life is similar. So the total installed cost savings based on this earlier study was, was 46% for a, for a steel structure. For open bottom box culvert, um, Similar findings, um, 
the the cost savings were about 38 percent so this was done based on an on an eight meter by eight meter span by a three meter rise 10 meter long structure so the yeah the the, the Commonly, the, the biggest thing people ask about these structures, will they last 75 years? And the, the thing is, is they can be designed uh, once you understand the site conditions um, better uh, to design to compete against uh, other options out there. And um, I just thought I'd put some pictures in here of floods. Uh, this is a little while ago now, it's 2013. Um, in Canmore, Alberta, there was a, a major apocalypse flood that happened, probably similar to the one that, ha that hit BC recently that I, I happened to live through. Uh, this is Cougar Creek, it's just um, in the town of Canmore, um, just on the, uh, uh, near Calgary on the way to Banff. And it basically the creek exploded with lots of debris and lots of water over a, a several days. And it um, devastated the, the, the channel, the existing channel and you'll see in this picture, there's a pipe that's actually in sort of midway up the screen. It was fully inundated. And um, I, I thought for sure when I saw this picture that, that it would be a goner. But uh, CSPI organized a trip out there and went and visited. Um, and that's what it looks like uh, after the flood and waters have gone. Uh, thanks to the end, the end treatments that were on, on the end of the structure, uh, the the, the backfill that I mentioned earlier that's so critical was kept in place. And I can't stress enough, if you're building in these areas on flashy creeks to really focus on the end treatment because that's that's what confines the backfill uh, around the structure. I don't often put a picture of myself in, the, in, the pic, in these uh, presentations, but I actually went out there with, uh, with CSPI and, and, and a couple other folks and, and looked at what other features, design features, and they actually had a rolled angle that went around the invert. That's what that brown thing is on the bottom of the of the structure. And they went in there after it was fully inundated, and they pulled out um, all kinds of rubble and and rock that was deposited. So that structure is back in service today. The other thing you can do about flood improving flood resilience is to simply increase the span. Commonly. Uh, pipes, especially round culverts, are designed to flow almost full. Uh, I wouldn't suggest you do that with, with arch open bottom structures. Um, on the left there, there's a, a picture of a, uh, an excerpt out of the, uh, the Ministry of Forests um, bridge design drawings that they commonly, they, they'll, they show a schematic there showing where the Q100 is within that arch and uh, where that red little line is around there, the, the ellipse there, it shows that the, the span of the structure should be 20% more than the natural stream width. So it's not confining the stream. The stream is allowed to operate just like it would normally. So you're not constricting it. You're not forcing it through a, a funnel. Um, and that picture on the right is one of the, the uh, longer span BCMOT projects. Um, it's an 18 meter span, um, again, in mountain environment. And um, it's got uh, cast in place head walls that come up uh, to the Q200 level. And then above that are MSE walls. So very resilient structure. The other way you can boost flood resilience is to add sheet pile. Um, and how that's done is there's a picture in the upper right of an excavator with um, some, some sheet pile and they just agitate it, it vibrates and it goes into the ground. It's very quick. It's not a drop hammer that you'd see a typical sheet pile go in with. So these are put in to surround um, the footings. The footings again can be either spread footings or they can be um, pile foundations. But the goal is, is, to, is to drive that sheet pile down so that you don't have to concern yourself with scour uh, in, in the case of a giant flood event. Another technique of improving resilience around a buried structure is to add geotextile layers. Uh, and these are, these are layered in commonly anywhere between six to eight inches in depth. And the idea is to, is to confine the backfill in case of a, of a significant flood. So that same um, flood that I showed you back in Canmore, th this is a, the picture on the lower right there is, is another structure just another part of Alberta where, yeah, the floodwaters came up and sat there for days. And normally if, if you didn't have um, that geotextile confining everything, it would have gradually piped out the backfill. Um, so putting in geotextile to confine the backfill 
just to deal with a hydraulic gradient, it makes a lot of sense. It's not terribly expensive. There's nothing really magical about it. Another technique that you can improve resilience is to make the pipe stronger. Um, it, it's little out there, but uh, in, in, in the Yukon, uh, they use welded seam um, pipe, mainly for to improve the structure in terms of its lengthwise durability or its lengthwise stiffness. So they actually um, go in and we, we weld the, the, the lock seams uh, that spiral around the pipe to make it stiffer. And we'll put that in the ground uh, surrounded by lots of styrofoam to block the, 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 the heat transfer. And it just makes the, the, the whole thing hang together much better in, in melting permafrost. We can also go with deep corrugated small diameter as well. That's an interesting project where I had to reline an existing escape tunnel in a mine uh, where you can use much, much stiffer structures and um, in, in order to, to accommodate any kind of subsequent movement. Now I'm just gonna take a tour across Canada looking at uh, some projects starting in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, this is a, a, a box culvert um, with cast in place headwalls on cast in place footings. So probably shallow bedrock, so it's cast right on there. Prince Edward Island, uh, interesting, just a, an arch project, great separation using local backfill materials and, and MSC walls on either end. Nova Scotia, another polymer coated uh, arch in a, in a tidal zone uh, with MSE walls on either end. Another grade separation type structure with the, with the drone technology. These pictures get more and more exciting. Uh, this, this picture actually shows a balanced backfill uh, where you see on the, on the right hand side, we've got an, an MSC wall uh, running out um, and, and, and buttressing the other side of the structure. And you can show this, this also shows the phase type applications. So if you have to build the structure in, in halves or in phases, uh, they're actually quite simple to build that way. You just have to understand where the traffic has to be. And New Brunswick, uh, the Fundy Foot Trail Parkway. Um, this is uh, just a, a polymer coated um, um, bolt or uh, sorry, a structural plate with um, it was stainless steel baffles inside to promote fist passage. Another grade separation in Quebec, just sitting on concrete footings. And then going to Ontario, um, I hear it's cold there once in a while, but uh, this, this structure here is, you can actually see that the channel is uh, filled up with ice at this point. Another great reason to make the spans bigger um, is, is to deal with ice. And in Ontario, just sort of uh, just out north, uh, north of Toronto there in the Muskoka area, um, you get this tea colored type water. It's good to use polymer coated just in the haunch plates. That's what that black material is there. And that's to deal with, with that, uh, that water that, um, that it's a bit more acidic. And Halton Hills in Ontario, another box type structure. It's very flexible with what kind of end walls you want to put on there. You can put gabions or concrete or whatever suits your imagination. In Manitoba, this is a causeway just with some, uh, um, some structural plate that was put in. And this is in lieu of a, of a clear span bridge. They put this across and filled up the, the space with, um, with backfill and then put cast to place head walls on either end. And in Saskatchewan, uh, another um, project in Regina. So this is a beveled end. These are actually performed very, very well uh, hydraulically. Um, yeah, that's another picture of me, I'm sorry. But anyway, that was me looking at another pipe with Ray. And Alberta, if anybody's been out traveling through the parks, uh, Canada, Parks Canada's installed uh, four sets of these um, just between Lake Louise and Banff. Uh, these are intended to get animals across the, the highway as well. I think AT is in the process of building a, uh, even bigger ones um, just near Exshaw, just further towards uh, Calgary currently, probably in the 24 meter, meter span, span range. And in Calgary itself, uh, there's lots of examples of these, the box and a, a pair of boxes under a fair amount of cover with some very nice uh, masonry head walls on either end. 
and also in the, in the Calgary areas, another uh, bevel ended uh, deep corrugated structure uh, with uh, head walls on either end as well. And not far from where I live, about 20 minutes near the ocean, is uh, some polymer coated um, uh, ellipses that were installed a while ago and some agricultural water that. Uh, that looks like it's blooming with algae and uh, where you'd probably want to use polymer coated, uh, mainly because of the acidic soils. In the Rockies um, near Revelstoke, uh, here's a, a head wall, uh, sort of a sheet pile head wall on a nice um, structural plate on footings. And just to finish off, I uh, just thought I'd show something really exciting. This is actually the, the longest span structure in the world currently, 32.4 uh, meters, 106 feet in span. Uh, interesting photo here. And that's what it looks like just from a, an aerial photo. So you've got two 32.4 meter spans uh, side by side and a 24 meter on the right. Thank you, Phil. Okay, I'm going to uh, finish off by just showing you that uh, a, year, a couple of years back in 2018, we undertook um, to try to find out where we stood with regards to our carbon footprint. And we've had a number of studies done. Uh, you may have heard of what is called an environmental product declaration, which more or less tells you uh, everything you want to know, but we're afraid to ask with regards to your carbon footprint, greenhouse gas emissions, acidification, eutrophication, all that type of stuff. So we had that study done, and then we also did other studies to compare ourselves against competing products and so forth. So I won't go into a lot of detail, but um, if you were to um, look at our environmental product declaration, you're going to see the results page like that. Not uh, easy for most people to understand. I know everyone who's probably watching could do those uh, calculations probably with the flick of their finger. But most people, how many people would know what 1.79 times 10 to the minus 13 equals? Um, so I may, I'm just going to make it easy and quick for you just to, to show you the results of one metric ton of steel, we would produce about 1.5 tons of carbon. That's equivalent to driving that car about 32% of the year, heating those homes about a quarter of the year, or using 61 propane cylinders for your home barbecue. And again, I have a whole few slew of statistics, but I will not get into at this stage of the game. We do have an environmental calculator on our website. So if you're ever in need of looking at uh, say corrugated steel pipe or whatever, and you're interested in looking at what the carbon footprint is, and we've even compared ourselves against reinforced concrete pipe to determine how we stand against a competitive material. But that is on our website uh, and is available to anyone and everyone. Uh, just to show you legislation that exists, you have the Buy Clean California Act in the United States, they're the leaders, meaning if you want to sell products to the state of California in the year 2022, you're going to have to meet a certain carbon footprint. In Canada, we have the low, low carbon assets through life cycle assessment, but at this stage of the game, no legislation that dictates where you need to be at this, uh, this stage. And I give kudos to the city of Calgary who have moved to Envision and uh, trying to capture their carbon footprint and have done a great job of uh, some of the cities that I've looked at. Uh, last slide here, uh, just so that you know, corrugated structural plate is 100% Canadian made. All of the raw materials that Phil showed are 100% Canadian. And that is it. We'll open it up for, uh, for questions. I'll send it back to Amin. And I do want to tell you, everyone who's attended today, we will send you out a, uh, a sheet saying that you attended and you'll get one hour credit for your, uh, uh, you know, if you're a PN or whatever you are, and if you have, um, you know, where you have to meet so many hours per year, we will send that to, to you for, for one hour. Okay, I'm in. Great, and um, thanks, Phil, for, for this uh, very informative presentation and quite practical as well. We, uh, I see we have quite a few questions uh, coming up. Uh, it, it shows that uh, the audience are, are quite engaged with your presentation. First question, I believe, uh, for you, Phil, uh, are there any overlapping patterns need to be followed when the structural plates are assembled? Um, yep, it, there is um, for shallow corrugated place. So the 152 by 51, um, you, you do need to um, make sure that 
um, the longitudinal seams are lapped correctly. Um, and um, there, so there's a there's drawings and there's there's the, but the rule of thumb is that the valley bolt has to be uh, closest to the visible edge. So I know that's hard to explain, you know, with my hands, but basically when you're pl putting the plates on, um, they have to be lapped correctly. And so there's little diagrams we actually have in the in the in the CSPI handbook on how to do it correctly, but it's really important. And uh, so that that's the case with with shallow corrugated plate. But so it uh, it's. Uh, displayed in the in the handbook yep. and uh, would you say is it the responsibility of the designer to uh, to indicate that or the factory um it's commonly put on the um on the uh manufacturer's um uh shop drawings so it's and there's there's usually a manual uh some some manufacturers provide a manual for that uh, with pictures on how that works um um but yeah it's it's there's also descriptions depending on where you are in Canada. Uh, there's a lot of expertise, say, where I work a lot in Alberta, uh, that where all the plate assemblers know that. And so there's not a lot of mystery, as well as a lot of the consulting engineers know that too. So it's the first thing you'll actually look at when you go to the job site. So uh, the next question, uh, we get it quite often. So I'm, uh, I'm assuming uh, Ray could, could answer that. How do you ensure polymer coating is not damaged during installation? Well, um, we have technical bulletins on handling, storage, uh, you know, loading and unloading. Uh, there's, it can happen. I mean, let's face it, um, things happen out there. We even have, you know, we, we tell them basically what to use, how to protect it and so forth. It's very tough. I mean, if I were to give you a hammer and you were to hammer it, you're not going to do anything to it at all. But we're talking about, you know, serious blows where you get a forklift truck and it, it bam, you know, it puts its fork into it or, um, you know, when it's being unloaded, uh, the loader scrapes it or whatever. So it can happen. And if it does, there are repair methods to uh, repair it in the field. So it's a very, very tough coating and very difficult to damage. But you know, it, do, it does happen on construction sites, absolutely. And like I say, we have technical bulletins for everything from handling to uh, rep reparations if, if required. Phil, uh, have you in the field witnessed any instances where, where you saw uh, where there was an accident that caused such a damage to, uh, to follow yep. coding? Yeah, I, I have seen um, um, more to do with how it's shipped uh, or how it's offloaded. Sometimes uh, contractors may not uh, treat it, um, you know, with all the care and attention that we, and we actually have, you know, a, a, a little sheet that we actually give to the contractors to how to unload it correctly without damaging it. But sometimes it happens. Um, in that case, I would go up or somebody, you know, the manufacturer would go up, show them how to repair it uh, using the, the, you know, the technique that we have and using the tape and, and um, yeah, and it gets done, uh, but it doesn't get dis wrecked during during installation. Like while they're backfilling it, it's from based on what I've seen, it's it's sometimes when it's being shipped. And but it's very it's fairly uncommon nowadays that that happens because we take a lot of precautions trying to educate people on how to unload this the, the product. Uh, the next question, I guess you answered it at the the very last uh, slide. What is the maximum span? Okay, so you're going to test my memory. Uh, okay, it's 106 <laughs> feet in span. So that's big. Yeah, 30, so. 32.4 meters in span right now. And yep. my, my question is, what's going to be the next one? You know, who's going I to beat that? It's up for challenge then. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, the coming other question uh, for the durability of structures. Are there uh, limits to the coating repairs that are uh, needed? For example, if there is a 10 millimeter long scratch in the coating, is that okay to leave it or will this cause a reduction in the service life? There, yeah, there are limitations to what you can um, um, safely, you know, um, and, and actually one of, the, one of the places that actually is limited that is Alberta. Uh, AT has come out with some pretty strict requirements. Um, on what is permissible to, to, to uh, repair versus what is, you know, uh, basically stop 
and replace. Um, and so and I, I think that's being uh, more codified in the upcoming CSA. I'm, I, I'm not totally sure, but I've heard rumors that that's the case. So um, yeah, so it's, it's being dealt with as we speak. Yeah, we, we cover that and then it's, it's gonna be in the new CSA G401 update in 2022. And we also have it, uh, we've had it in our technical bulletin for quite some time, but it will be in the standards uh, going forward. I mean, there are times when um, the, the, they may go over, you know, uh, the scratch or the tear or what have you, because it's already been installed. There's, uh, you know, construction time, uh, all kinds of different, you know, things have to happen. So we can still repair, you know, the bigger marks or what have you, but, um, you know, there will be um, suggested limits, let's so to speak, whereas you reject or repair type of thing. Uh, the last part of that question is, is there any uh, best practice guide for installation to avoid damage of uh, buried infrastructure, prepared pitch panels? Uh, hmm. There, uh, um, the CSPI uh, handbook actually has some very good, there's a whole chapter on how to install buried structures. And, and do it properly. That's probably the first place I would look. It's it's available on CSPI website. You can pull it off. Um, otherwise, manufacturers are a good resource if you want to talk to somebody. Um, there's a few of us out here uh, that you know are more than willing to help and show pictures on how to do it. Some some manufacturers have manuals on how to install these things, and um, and they're a great you know uh, resource as well. Cool. Uh, the next question is uh, with respect to polymer coatings. Is delamination uh, an issue? No, none whatsoever. Um, not that I have seen. Um, you know, the uh, the coating is uh, pretty well 10 to 12 mil on either side, and it's even deeper in the valleys and so forth, up towards a 20 and, and so forth. Um, I have never seen a, a delaminated uh, structural plate. Have you, Phil? Yeah, so I, I can I can maybe talk to that. Um, early in the sort of the the development of polymer coated plate, uh, there was there was experimentation done using um, polymer coating over hot dip galvanized, and and there was signs that that could delaminate. Since then, we we don't hot dip galvanize below the polymer coating. We use a polymer or we use a a zinc rich primer, which is much more uh, adhesive to, there, there is no delamination. Uh, it doesn't come apart, um, you know, what people might think it does. So, and, and the secret behind that is that zinc rich primer that's below the polymer coating. Most of the uh, damage that I have seen them in is, uh, it's been hit, you know, hit by a fork or, uh, you know, a backhoe or whatever, getting too close to the structure, that type of stuff. I've seen stuff like that. Would, uh, would aggregate compaction of the of the backfill would that cause any any damage to the coating? No, I, I've I've used it, and I, I've I've never seen that happen before. Um, you know, just the backfilling forces, even if it's crushed stone, it doesn't wreck the the coating. So just, just to kind of expand on that, um, like polymer coated, powder coated uh, plate, the, the same, it's the same basic product as the polymer laminated CSP and polymer laminated CSP has been around for probably 40 or 50, well, 40 years. And, and it, it's, it's used every single day by all kinds of jurisdictions outside of Canada as well. So it, it's a mature product. There's no concerns with it. Um, so it's the same, it's the identical um, chemical properties of, of, the, of the powder coated plate product coating. Uh, the next, uh, well, the, uh, the last part of this question is, uh, are the bolted connections, uh, con would they be considered points of failure or, or weak points with regards to uh, polymer coating? With regards to polymer coating. Um, no, I mean we uh, there there it's a design check that we do a structural design check for uh, and we call it seam strength. So we 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 calculate that as a potential you know obviously a, a, a one of the load cases or things that we check for in, in the various codes. Um, 
in terms of polymer coating, no, it, it shouldn't really be a, a big issue. Um, there is some work being done by by Ray and others, uh, CSPI, on coming up with different types of bolts that will have uh, greater and greater longevity. Maybe, Ray, you can talk to that. Uh, we'll have a new bolt that will be in CSAG 401. It is now in the ASTM spec. It's actually made in Canada, which is kudos for Canada, because most of the hot dip galvanized bolts either come outside of Canada, a lot from China and so forth. Whereas this bolt is made in uh, just it's Scarborough, just outside of Toronto by Leland Industries. And it's called the NZF 3000. Uh, we have tested it in the lab over the last four years. We've also tested it out in sites. And this bolt tests about the same longevity as polymer coated structural plates. So this bolt will go with polymer coated uh, uh, in the future. And it's um, very, very durable with regards to corrosiveness and so forth. It has probably five to six times the, uh, the life of a hot dip galvanized bolt. So it'll be in CSAG 401 uh, very, very soon. The next question is, uh, what kind of uh, preventative maintenance is typically needed over the lifespan? Um, I can answer that to a point. Uh, there's there's um, things that you can look for, say for grade separations. Um, I've, I've worked with different DOTs um, on grade separations where you've got a vehicle going underneath the highway and you've got a big arch. Uh, it commonly, uh, it's it's, it sounds ridiculous, but the only thing they do is go in and pressure wash uh, the salt off the inside of the structure uh, every spring. So that's kind of it. Um, in, in terms of looking at um, other types of things, it, once it, the key is to get the, the structure outside of the water. That's commonly the, the biggest thing I would say um, if you're looking at open bottom structures. Uh, but yeah, it and that helps with that that concern I had, or we were talking earlier about abrasion. Uh, if you're if you're well outside of the web rutted perimeter you don't have really any maintenance to to do it's just it has air so there's very little maintenance involved if they're sized correctly so, so that's in terms of uh preventative maintenance uh, would there be any uh, anticipated rehabilitation along the lifespan of the uh, the structure yep it, there is a once you go through your service life calcs and, and and you you have to you think about well you know is there a uh, is there a need to slip line this at some point? And what I mean by that is you slide in a new liner uh, at some time in the future. And, and so we, we've done that. Uh, it's, it's not uncommon. We do it you know, usually once or twice a year. The last one I did was in Calgary um, for the city of Calgary. And we just slid in a liner uh, and then you know, basically grouted up the annulus and you end up with a brand new structure at the end of the day. And how often uh, usually uh, during the, the lifespan of, uh, of such a uh, structure would you need a, a liner um it, it can range um depending on what happens to the structure like you can do it you know i think the 50 45 years something like that it's not like you're out there continuously doing it um and it's and it you just have to keep an eye on the structure go out and take some measurements of the existing and look at the you know that what's um what's happening with you know the the on the surface that is and what's happening with the backfill envelope around it. Um, it. It is a specialty business to go out and do that rehabilitation, but it's it's very common. Uh, I just noticed that we're a bit over time, but we, we have so many people that are still tuned in. So I'll just take one more question and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. Uh, what is the deflection percent uh, that's allowable during installation and after completion, if there's any? Yeah, so um, I, maybe I can answer that. Sorry, Ray. Um, normally sure, during uh, backfilling of the structure assembly, um, yeah, you after after it's assembled, you, you monitor how much the structure is moving under backfill. Uh, if for deep corrugated, it's commonly uh, one to two percent, um, and and for shallow corrugated, similar. So you keep an eye on those those what what it's the span and the rise is doing, and you write it down and you measure it as you're backfilling. Um, after it's backfilled and in service, um, yeah, you can go back in there and measure it. And it, you know, it, it no normally there's limitations of again of a further one percent uh, of, of movement over time. But if the embankments are stable, the structure's stable, it's it won't move. I've gone back and looked at different structures over time, and 
what you what you build is what you get at the end of the day. Uh, Ray, any comments on this question? Uh, no, totally agree with Phil. Um, mm -hmm. You know, two percent. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, with that, we we have more questions to go, but uh, unfortunately, uh, not enough time. We'll we'll forward the the typed questions to the to the panelists, and they'll hopefully get back to you within uh, within email. Uh, with that, I would like to thank thank everyone that attended today and took time from their busy day. And mostly, I would like to thank Ray and Phil for uh, taking the time and sharing their wealth of experience on uh, on this topic. And uh, uh, just to conclude, this uh, webinar will be, uh, the recording will be posted on YouTube. So stay tuned for that. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Amen. Yep, thanks. Thanks.